Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to part three of uh, this lecture series on the loan obligation and contracts. Let me share my screen with you. Okay. So we continue with Article 1189. So Article 1189 talks about effects on loss for deterioration of the object, not pending the fulfillment of a suspensive condition. So according to 1189, when the conditions have been imposed with the intention of suspending the efficacy of an obligation to give, the following rule shall be observed in case of improvement, loss, or deterioration of the thing during the pendency of the condition. Okay. If the thing is lost without the fault of the debtor, then the obligation shall be extinguished. Second, if the thing is lost through the fault of the debtor, he shall be obliged to pay damages. It shall be understood that the thing is lost when it perishes, goes out of commerce, or it disappears in such a way that its existence is unknown or it cannot be recovered. Third, when the thing deteriorates without the fault of the debtor, then the impairment is to be borne by the creditor. Fourth, if it deteriorates through the fault of the debtor, the creditor may choose between rescission of the obligation and its fulfillment with indemnity for damages in either case. Fifth, if the thing is improved by its nature or by time, the improvement shall inure to the benefit of the creditor. Sixth, if it is improved at the expense of the debtor, he shall, know, he sh he shall have no other right than that granted to the use of Proctuary. Okay, let us break down Article 1189. Now, Article 1189 applies only if the obligation is a real obligation. When you say real obligation, the obligation or prestation involved is delivery no, or payment. Now, second, the object must be determinate. You remember the rule that the loss of the thing without the fault of the creditor due to a fortuitous event will extinguish the obligation only if the object is determinate. So 1189 will apply only if the obligation is real. And second, the object is determinate. Now, third, the object is the obligation rather is subject to a suspensive condition. Now, when you say suspensive condition, this pertains to both uh, what uh, a future and uncertain no? uh, happening, the happening of which will give rise to the obligation. Now, fourth, the condition is fulfilled. And that fifth, there is loss, deterioration, or improvement of the thing during the pendency of the condition. Now, 1189 will apply only if the loss, deterioration, or improvement, or what I call as LDI, loss, deterioration, or improvement of the thing happened during the pendency or before the happening of the condition. Now, what are the rules? First, let us define loss. When you say loss, there is physical, legal, or civil loss. Physical loss is when a thing perishes. Legal loss means that a thing goes out of commerce or a thing heretofore becomes illegal. Now, when you say civil loss, a thing disappears in such a way that its existence is unknown or if known, it is impossible to recover, whether as a matter of fact or of law. Okay, what is the rule that is summarized under Article 1189? Now, in case of loss, deterioration, or improvement, LDI of the thing during dependency of a suspensive condition, if the loss of the thing is without the fault of the debtor, then the obligation is extinguished. That is fair and square. Now, second, if the loss of the thing is to the debtor's fault, then he becomes liable for damages. Third, if the thing deteriorates without the fault of the debtor, then definitely the creditor will bear the impairment. 
when you say deterioration, the value of the thing is reduced or impaired with or without the fault of the debtor. Now, if the thing deteriorates, on the other hand, through the fault of the debtor, then the creditor have two options or has two options. The creditor may choose between rescission. And when you say rescission, that means cancellation of the obligation. Or the creditor may opt fulfillment of the obligation with indemnity for damages in both cases. Fifth, if the thing is improved by nature or by time, no? The improvement shall inure to the benefit of the creditor. A thing is improved when its value is increased or enhanced by nature, by time, or by or the expense of the debtor or creditor. Now, if the thing is improved at the expense of the debtor, definitely the debtor will have the right to a usufructuary. Now, the rule in number six, no, if the thing is improved at the expense of the debtor, meaning at his behest or through the exer exertion of efforts by the debtor, then he will acquire the right of or right to a usufructuary, which, which begs the question, what do you mean by usufruct, usufruct or usufructuary? Usufruct is the right to enjoy the use and fruits of a thing belonging to another. Now that is the civil law definition of usufruct. Usufructuary is the person entitled to the use or the right, the person having the right to enjoy the property and the fruits thereof belonging to another. That is what you call the right of usufructuary. In case that the thing is improved at the expense or at the behest of the debtor, meaning through the debtor's exertion of efforts, then he will acquire the right to use, to enjoy, and the right to what to reap the fruits of the property belonging to another. Okay. Now, when the conditions, let us go to 1190. Now, Article 1190 provides that when the conditions have for their purpose the extinguishment of an obligation to give, the parties upon the fulfillment of said conditions shall return to each other what they have received. In case of loss, deterioration, or improvement of the thing, the provisions which with respect to the debtor are laid down in the preceding article, meaning 1189, shall be applied to the party who is bound to return. As for obligations to do and not to do, the provisions of second paragraph of 1187 shall be observed as regards the effect of the extinguishment of obligation. Now, 1190 talks about effects of fulfillment of a resolutory condition. What is a resolutory condition? Condition? A resolutory condition is where the happening of which will extinguish the obligation. Now, in obligations to give, the obligation is extinguished and the parties are obliged to return to each other what they have received under the obligation. This is what we call mutual restitution. Now, the happening of a resolutory condition has the effect of what? The parties being obliged to return to each other what they have received under the obligation if the obligation is a real obligation or obligation to give. Now, the effect of the fulfillment of a resolutory condition is retroactive. When you say retroactive, from the time that the resolutory condition occurs or is fulfilled, it will retroact. It will go back. It will apply from the date of the happening of the condition backwards. That is what I mean by retroactive. It will return to the status quo. When you say status quo, this is the condition of the parties prior to the happening of the, of the birth of the obligation, okay? Now, second, if the thing to be returned is legally in the possession of a third person who did not act in bad faith, the remedy of the party entitled to restitution is against the other, okay? The obligation of mutual restitution is absolute and it applies also to fruits and interest, meaning not only to the principal, 
but also as to the fruits and interest. Now, in obligations to give subject to a suspensive condition, the retroactivity admits exception according to the obligation uh, if the obligation is bilateral or unilateral under Article 1187. Now, let us break down Article 1190. What are the effects of fulfillment of a resolutory condition? In obligations to do or not to do, the courts shall determine the retroactive effect of the fulfillment of the resolutory condition. Okay. So that is 11.90. Now let us go to 11.91. Now 11.91 provides that the power to rescind obligations is implied in reciprocal ones in case one of the obligors should not comply with what is incumbent upon him. The injured party may choose between fulfillment and rescission of the obligation with payment of damages in either case. He may also seek rescission even after he has chosen fulfillment if the latter should become impossible. The court shall decree the rescission claim unless there be a just cause authorizing the fixing of a period. This is understood to be without prejudice to the rights of third persons who have acquired the thing in accordance with Article 1385, 1388, and the mortgage law. Now, 1191 class talks about what? The happening of uh, the, the, the power to rescind in case of reciprocal obligation. When you say reciprocal obligation class, that means that both parties will have to perform their own part or prestation of the contract. Now, if the obligation is reciprocal, no, as contrary to a unilateral obligation, then the power to rescind, the power to cancel the obligation is, is given to both parties. And this is made available in case one of the obligor should not comply with what is incumbent upon him. Okay? Now, there are two kinds of obligation according to the person obliged. You have unilateral and bilateral. Again, when you say unilateral, only one party is obliged to comply with the prestation. On the other hand, when you say bilateral, both parties are mutually bound to each other. Okay. There are two kinds of bilateral obligation. You have reciprocal, you have non-reciprocal. When you say reciprocal, bilateral obligation, this arises from, from, the, from the same cause and in which each party is a debtor and creditor of the other. While a non-reciprocal obligations, those which do not impose simultaneous and correlative performance on both parties. Okay. What is the remedy in case of reciprocal obligations? Now, if one of the obligors does not comply with what is incumbent upon him, then the aggrieved party may choose between action for specific performance of the obligation with damages or action for rescission with damages. When you say action for specific performance, the plaintiff is essentially asking the court to order the obligor to perform a specific prestation. On the other hand, when you say action for rescission, you are trying to get out from the contract because you would want to cancel it. Now, if there is non-compliance by one of the contracting parties or breach of contract, the court may grant the guilty party term for performance. Now, the court shall order rescission claim unless there is or there should be a just cause for granting the party in default a term or period for the performance of his obligation. Now, take note, class, that under 1191, the court may only rescind the contract if there is no just cause for the fixing of the term or period. Always remember that, Cass, huh? Just because a party was not able to perform his, con his part of the contract or his own obligation or prestation does not necessarily mean that a party can go to court and ask for rescission. If there is a just cause for the court 
to fix the term within which the prestation will be performed by the obligor, then the court will primarily fix the period. Now, in case that after the court had fixed the period and the obligor still failed to comply with his own part of the prestation, then that is the time that the aggrieved party may go to court and ask for rescission. So take note, class, that under Article 1191, rescission is only a secondary remedy. Now, the first remedy is for a party to ask for the fixing of the term or period for the performance of obligation. Now, under 1190, remedies are alternative. What do you mean by that? The aggrieved party may only choose one of the remedies, except that he may also seek rescission after he has chosen fulfillment if the latter should become impossible. Now, what do you mean by alternative remedies? So the aggrieved party may choose between what? Rescission with damages or specific performance with damages. However, class, if the aggrieved party has chosen specific performance, then question, can he later on ask the court to rescind the contract? Answer, yes, as long as if after choosing fulfillment or specific performance, it become later on impossible. Now, if the performance should later on become impossible, then the obligor may opt rescission. Okay. Now, limitations on the right to demand rescission. Now, a party may not automatically demand for rescission or cancellation of contract no, if in case that there is a reasonable or just cause for the court to fix the period first. Okay. Now, take note, class. That rescission under Article 1191 is that which is asked in a court of law. It is, it, it is essentially judicial, no? not extrajudicial. Now, and then second, the power of the court to fix period is when there is a just cause. And then third, right of third person, rescission is not available as a remedy. So, class, question. Even if no, there is um, failure to perform on the part of the obligor. Can a third person ask the court to cancel or rescind the contract? No? I will give you an example for better understanding. Okay. Suppose that there is a contract of sale for condominium unit between a developer and a buyer. No? Now, the buyer had purchased the condominium unit by installment. And during the time that the buyer is paying the condominium unit by installment, the buyer was given the right to possess the property. Now, since the buyer was given the right to possess the property, what the buyer did is to rent out the subject property. So there was a contract of lease executed between the buyer of the property by installment and a third person, the lessee. So the contract is not between the developer and the lessee, but between the buyer, lessor, and the lessee, the third person. Now, in case that the, the buyer of the condominium unit fails to pay the developer question, can the developer eject or seek for eviction of the lessee of the buyer? In other words, can the uh, developer go straight against the lessee of the lessor buyer now for rescission of the contract of lease between the lessor and the lessee? Answer under 1191 class, no. The developer, although the owner of the property, may not seek eviction of the lessee because rescission under 1191 is not an available remedy as against a third person. Kaya class, for example, bumili kayo ng condo, 
Tapos in the meantime na binabayaran nyo, pinaupahan nyo yung condo at nung hindi kayo makabayad, pinaalis ng developer ang inyong tenant, can you sue the developer for breach of contract or unlawful interference of contract? Answer, yes. Because class, the developer is a third party or a third person from the contract. And rescission under 1191 is not an available remedy as to third person. You have to remember, class, that the contract of lease is between the buyer, lessor, and the lessee, the third person, and not between the developer and the lessee. In so far as the contract of lease is concerned, the developer is not a party. He is a third person, and therefore, he may not opt to exercise the power of rescission under 1191. Now, fourth. 1191 will apply only in case of substantial violation or breach of the contract. No? As a rule, rescission is not available in case of slight breaches or slight violation of the contract. Okay. Now, 1191 is exercised primarily by extrajudicial means or by sending um, letter no? or demand letters and in case the other party does not agree, then resort to judicial action can be had. Let us go to 1192. What if both parties have committed a violation of the contract? Now, this is the, the subject matter of 1192. Now, in case both parties have committed a breach of the obligation, the liability of the first infractor shall be equitably tempered by the courts. If it cannot be determined which of the parties first violated the contract, the same shall be deemed extinguished and each shall bear his own damages. Now, 1192 talks about the instance where both parties are guilty of breach. Now, what is the first rule? If the first infractor is known, then the liability of the first infractor shall be equitably reduced to that of the, the breach of the second infractor. No? On the other hand, if the first infractor cannot be determined, in other words, class, the... Uh, Pareho silang merong pagkakamali. No, both parties have committed breach, but it cannot be determined who, as a matter of fact, have committed the first infraction of the contract. Now, if the first infractor cannot be determined, then the contract shall be extinguished. No, and each shall bear his own damages. Okay, let us go to chapter three, different kinds of obligations. Section two, obligations with a period. 1193. Obligations for whose fulfillment a day certain has been fixed shall be demandable only when that day comes. Obligations with a resolutory period shall take effect at once but terminate upon the arrival of the day certain. A day certain is understood to be that which must necessarily come although it may not be known when. If the uncertainty consists in whether the day will come or not, the obligation is conditional and it shall be regulated by the rules of the preceding section. Now, what is an obligation with a period? An obligation with a period effects or consequences are subjected to expiration or arrival of said period or term. When you say period class, it refers to future and certain event which arises or extinguishes the obligation. Class, take note that future, that a period rather, is both in the future and certain to happen. No, not future or certain. It must be future and certain to happen. Okay, let us distinguish between a period in a and a condition. As to fulfillment, period is certain while a condition is uncertain. As to time, period is in the future, while a condition can be can refer to both future and past. 
class, you remember our discussion on a condition where, where the condition is peg on a past event unknown to the parties, di ba? If, if the happening, uh, if the fulfillment is dependent upon a past event unknown to the parties, then condition refers to the what? The parties coming or discovering the past event unknown to them. No? So in a condition, a past event unknown to the parties can be um, available. Whereas a, on a period, it is always and always in the future. As to influence, period fixes the time for the efficaciousness of the obligation, while a condition, it arises or extinguishes an obligation. As to effect, when left in debtor's will, okay, ito, class, di ba? May, may formula tayo dito. If the period is dependent upon the sole will of the debtor, what is the status of the contract? No, it is valid. It will only empower the court to fix the obligation. On the other hand, if condition is dependent upon the sole will of the debtor, the answer is, what is the status of the contract? If condition is dependent upon the sole will of the debtor, it depends. It depends. Actually, the answer is, it depends. If condition is suspensive in nature, then the contract is void. Whereas if condition is resolutory in nature, then the condition is valid. Now, why do we say that if the suspensive condition is, val is uh, the one void? Kasi class, if what is left to the debtor's will is a suspensive condition, that then it will render the obligation nugatory. Because the debtor is normally not interested in the performance of his prestation. On the other hand, if what is left in the debtor's will is a resolutory condition, then the obligation is valid because the debtor is interested in the extinguishment of the obligation. Now, what about retroactivity of the effect? In a period, there is no retroactive effect unless otherwise agreed upon by the parties, whereas the happening of a condition has a retroactive effect. Okay, there are two stages of a contract. Number one is the birth or perfection of the contract. Number two, the performance of or consummation of the contract. What are the kinds of period according to effect? Suspensive period gives rise to an obligation and is not demandable upon commence just on the arrival of the period. For example, I will give you a gift on your birthday. Now, it is suspensive in nature because the happening of which will give rise to an obligation and it is not demandable upon the commencement or perfection of the contract but upon arrival of the period. What about a resolutory condition or a resolutory period rather? A resolutory period extinguishes the obligation and is immediately demandable. For example, I will give you an allowance until you pass the board exam. That is an example of resolutory period because the giving of the allowance is immediately demandable and it will terminate assuming that, oh well, actually, the passing of the board exam is not a period, it is, it is a condition. For example, I will give you an allowance until you reach the age of majority, 18 years old. So that can be a period, no? It is immediately demandable and what it is uh, it will the happening of the period will extinguish the obligation now let us go to 1194 in case of loss deterioration or improvement of the thing before the arrival of the day certain the rules of 1189 shall be observed so the rules on ldi will apply under 1189 or under the uh, Conditional obligation will apply also to obligations with a period. Now, anything paid or delivered before the arrival of the period, 
the obligor being unaware of the period or believing that the obligation has become due and demandable may be recovered with the fruits and interest. Now, 1195 talks about the payment or delivery before the arrival of the period, which depends upon the awareness of the debtor. What is the rule? If the debtor is aware and nevertheless pays, he is knowledgeable and considered as intentionally paying in advance. In this case class, the debtor is deemed to have waived the period in his favor. No? And that the payment is considered to have been done intentionally. Now, if the debtor is unaware of the period, it is considered as a quasi-contract of solution in debity or payment by mistake which uh, entitles the payer or the obligor to recover what has been paid by mistake. Take note, class, that 1195 does not apply to personal obligations because service cannot be recovered and you cannot undo what has been done. Because of impracticality, it applies only to real obligation. We go to 1196. Okay? Whenever in an obligation a period is designated, it is presumed to have been established for the benefit of both the creditor and the debtor. Unless from the tenor of the same or other circumstances, it should appear that the period has been established in favor of one or of the other. 1196 states that the period is presumed to, have, to be for the benefit of both the creditor and the debtor. This is the general rule. If the obligation is with a period, then the period is presumed to be for the benefit of both parties. Plain and simple. Now, if the obligation consists in the payment of interest or payment for the interest for the use of money, or if there, if there is no interest for the loan, then the debtor could compel the creditor to accept the payment because the contract is gratuitous in the first place. So it will depend, class, upon the circumstances of the situation or the stipulation of the parties. If there is no interest, then the debtor ca can compel the creditor to accept his payment because the contract is gratuitous or without payment of interest. On the other hand, if there is payment of interest, then that means that the debtor cannot compel the creditor to accept his payment because the payment of interest means that the, the period is presumed to be for the benefit of the creditor. No? Okay. Let us go to 1197. If the obligation does not fix a period, but from its nature and circumstances, it can be inferred that a period was intended, the courts may fix the duration thereof. The courts shall also fix the duration of the period when it depends upon the will of the debtor. In every case, the court shall determine such period as may, be, as may under the circumstances have been probably contemplated by the parties. Once fixed by the courts, the period cannot be changed by them. Article 1197 talks about what? When a circumstance, when the court can fix the period. Take note, class, that under 1197, the court can only fix the period if the parties intended a period in the first place. Tandaan niya, class, ha? The court cannot impose its own will upon the parties. The parties must have intended a period in the first place. Because if the parties class did not intend a period in the first place, then the court cannot fix the period for them. Because if the court will fix the period for the parties, even without clear intention on their part, then the court is to the effect as amending the contract. The contract is the law between the parties. No? The court cannot substitute its decision and interfere with the contract because it is the law between the parties. So that's 1197. We go to 1198. 1198 gives you the instances 
when the debtor loses the right to make use of the period. Now, the debtor shall lose every right to make use of the period, number one, when after the obligation has been contracted, he becomes insolvent unless he gives a guarantee or security for the debt. Number two, when he does not furnish to the creditor the guarantees or securities which he has promised. Third, when by his own acts, he has impaired said guarantees or securities after their establishment and when through a fortuitous event, they disappear unless he immediately gives a new ones equally satisfactory. Fourth, when the debtor violates any undertaking in consideration of which the creditor agreed in the period. And fifth, when the debtor attempts to abscond. Take note, class, that you have to memorize these five instances under 1198. Memorize and memorize, class. These are exclusive lists. When you say exclusive list, these are the only instances when the debtor loses the right to make use of the period. Class, when you say that the debtor loses the right to make use of the period, if any of these five instances will occur, then the obligation becomes immediately demandable. No, that is what you mean by the debtor losing the right to make use of the period. 1198 no, is about the circumstances that will make the debtor lose the right to make use of the period. So I have given you here a summary of 1198. No, when there is insolvency. No, when you say insolvency, the, the asset is less than the liabilities. No, unless the debtor gives a guarantee or security. No, guarantee meaning in the future or when it is impaired unless the debtor gives new ones equally satisfactory when there's a violation of undertaking and when the debtor attempts to abscond. Okay, under 1198, class take note of the distinction between liquidity and solvency. Just because a debtor becomes illiquid does not mean that he will lose the right to make use of the period. What is referred under 1198 is solvency, not liquidity. Now, when you say liquidity, it refers to the ability to convert assets into cash. While solvency is the ability to pay liabilities with assets. Okay, A solvent person could, could be illiquid at the same time because he could be able to pay his liabilities with his assets but not easily convert it into cash. No? What do you mean by guarantor or substitute or replacement? Class, a guarantor is a person who will be liable in case of non-payment by the debtor or the original debtor. A security, on the other hand, is a property constituted as a mortgage when the debtor just has more liabilities but still has assets. So class guarantor refers to a person. No, it is a human person. And a security refers to what? A mortgage. It can be a real estate mortgage or a chattel mortgage. Or a pledge in case of personal property. But take note class that pledge is a real contract, meaning it requires delivery before its perfection unlike chattel mortgage and real estate mortgage. Okay. Tangent pala. Real estate mortgage, chattel mortgage, and contract of pledge. Okay. Giving guarantee or security means that the debtor can still pay even if have failed to do so according to the agreement. It can answer the said failure. Now, what happens if the debtor loses the right to make use of the period? Then the obligation becomes pure and immediately demandable. That is the uh, consequence under 1198. Take note, class, that if a fortuitous event made the guarantee or security disappear, then the debtor will still lose the right 
to make use of the period. Di ba, class? Remember that if uh, uh, under the general rule, if the thing is lost due to a fortuitous event, then the obligation is extinguished. But this rule under 1189 presents a little modification on the effect of happening of a fortuitous event as regards the guarantee or security constituted by the debtor. This is the only rule under the loan obligation and contracts that makes the debtor liable even after a fortuitous event occurred, no? aside from the exceptions. Take note that if the guarantee or security disappear, even in the event of a fortuitous event, then still the debtor will lose the right to make use of the period. Do not qualify class whether or not this, the guarantee or security was lost due, due to the fault of the debtor. Even if the guarantee or security has disappeared without the fault on the part of the debtor, as long as it is because of a fortuitous event, then he will lose the right to make use of the period. Take note of that. Okay? So this ends our presentation. I'll see you again on part four. Thank you.